Brought to you by JMR Rentals, jmrny.com. Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend. I'm Jason Godby, and today on the program, we're talking about the new action film from Lionsgate, Sisu. Later, I'll be speaking with the director of the film, Yalmari Hallander. But first, we got some No Rest for the Weekend news. Today, we're back in the Rabbit Hole studio, and joining me is producer extraordinaire, Miss B Trade Oliver. Welcome, Oliver. Thank you for having me again. It's great to uh, it's great to have somebody to do this stuff with. I you know I get lonely when I'm here by myself. So I can see why. <laughs> All right. So what do we got for our first story? First up, we have a review of a couple of films from the San Francisco International Film Festival. The festival took place from April the 13th through the 23rd. Yeah, I managed to see some of the films uh, from uh, San Fro- San Francisco International Film Festival, which is a long title. They just call it SF Film for short. So I managed to see a couple of these films. Um, the first picture I saw was called Dolly Land. It's directed by Mary Heron. I don't know if you know her, but she directed American Psycho. And this stars Sir Ben Kingsley uh, as Salvador Dolly. Now, I can't for this one, I can't really go into detail because there's an embargo date, and this is going to air before the embargo date, but I'll give you like a brief, a brief, brief review. So this is a biopic of the surrealist artist Salvador Dali. Dali is seen through the eyes of a young man played by Christopher Brinney, who is assisting him before this big show in New York during the 1970s. He's got this real 70s flair to it. Kingsley was... Uh, well, you know, he's, he's Ben Kingsley, so he's amazing. As uh, Salvador Dali has a stellar supporting cast, including Barbara Sakawa, who plays this woman called Gala, who is his life slash business partner. She, like, manages his state, manages his affairs. It's a really good-looking film, really beautiful cinematography. This is Dali at the end of his life, you know, so it's old. He's, he's an old man at this point, and he's kind of losing it here and there. Can't go into too many details. All I can say is I definitely recommend it, especially if you're into artist biopics. Dolly Land will open in theaters here June 6th. And then I also saw a documentary called Bad Press. It's a rather complex film and to you could probably spend an entire show just talking about the issues in the movie. So it, it concerns freedom of the press in the Native American slash First Nations community. It takes place in Muskogee, Oklahoma which is someplace that, you know, you don't normally see movies set kind of thing. And it, and it's the people of the Muscogee Creek Nation. Now, apparently, I did not know this, but did you know that um, in First, America, First Native American First Nations, each one has its own constitution? Mm-hmm. So what I did not know is that in that constitution, freedom of the press is not guaranteed. In, our, in the U.S. Constitution, we have freedom of the press here. It's in the First Amendment. There is no such amendment or uh, provision in that First Nations tribal constitution. Did not know that. Yeah. So this was this was like news to me. I didn't know this. Um, And so that is it's like a discretion of the tribal council. And there's like a chief and a council kind of like it's almost like a little parliament kind of thing with a prime minister. But it's not guaranteed. So you have to vote on it. And in this story it, it begins with it's, it concerns this newspaper in the Muscogee Creek Nation and they the council votes to end freedom of the press I wrote a full review it's going to be on the website um, it's a very powerful documentary and it's one of those things that it makes you realize kind of the importance of freedom of the press not only for you know information but just to a democracy you know there's a reason why it's in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights but I also think that this is the kind of film that should be shown in schools. We need civics and social studies happening in this country. And this would be the kind of film that kids could watch and learn. And then they would realize why they need to know that stuff, because uh, you kind of see how how fragile those rights are. That was at San Francisco. They're 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 at SF Film um, online, but they're. Great festival. I didn't get to see everything from the fest, but I did get I did get to see those two. All right. So what's on what's next on the agenda? We have an update on the Tribeca Film Festival. Right back here in New York, uh, 
Tribeca Film Festival. They recently announced their lineup for 2023, and oh my, it's a stacked lineup, man. This is like this is like the 77 Yankees. This thing festival is going to run from the 7th to the 18th. They haven't announced the venues yet, but I suspect it'll be like last year. And you remember how it was like in venues all across yes, Manhattan, yes. from you know Tribeca. They their opening night last time I think it was like Spanish Harlem or yes, something like that, yes. way up there. The feature films will include 109 features. 127 filmmakers across 36 countries, including 93 world premieres. So, and this list of world premieres is great. First one is called Bucky Effing Dent, word I can't say on the air. Yes. Uh, that's directed by David Duchovny. Downtown Owl, which is by uh, Lily Rabb and Hamish Linklater. Eric LaRue is another film by Michael Shannon, who is also uh, a movie star. Then something called Fresh Kills by Jennifer Esposito. Mm-hmm. And then The Listener by Steve Buscemi will make its North American premiere. And there's another film called Shortcomings by Randall Park will be making its New York premiere. Uh, then we also have 53 documentary features, making its world premiere will be Marvel's first documentary called Stan Lee about the legendary Marvel creator directed by Tribeca alumnus David Gelb also screening uh, and this is this is a pretty stack list too so it's only life after all which is a documentary about the Indigo girls and we first mentioned this on the cast when it premiered in Sundance mm-hmm. or back in January so that's making the festival circuit rounds then we also have Chasing Chasing Amy, uh, which is about a filmmaker who goes on a journey of self-discovery while making a documentary about Kevin Smith's film, Chasing Amy, uh, which was a favorite of mine. It's like one of those 90s indie hits. Uh, so who knows? Maybe Kevin Smith will show up. Maybe we'll get to talk to him on a red carpet. And then we also have Rather, documentary about the iconic journalist Dan Rather. In addition, Tribeca Film Festival also announced their TV and Now programs. And this is another impressive list, including Full Circle, which is a limited series about an investigation into a botched kidnapping in New York City. After that screening, there'll be a talk with director slash executive producer Steven Soderbergh, along with the writer and executive producers Ed Solomon and Casey Silver. And the cast also screening is The Golden Boy, a documentary about Mexican-American boxing legend Oscar de la Hoya. The Horror of Dolores Roach, a contemporary Sweeney Todd-inspired mm. urban legend that started out as a Spotify audio series. So wow. it used to be a podcast. Wow. And then yet another Walking Dead series, The Walking Dead Dead City. It's a new series it's set in the Walking Dead universe, which will star Lauren Cohen and Jeffrey Dean Morgan. Uh, There's also going to be live performances, including one by Gloria Gaynor, who has a documentary about her life called Gloria Gaynor, I Will Survive. And then Sarah Bareilles, who uh, is a pop star, but also did the musical Waitress. There'll be a premiere of the movie of Waitress the Musical live on Broadway. Lots happening. So you heard the list. What are you looking for? Um, What are you looking forward to in that list? Well, so far, I, I think I'm kind of interested in the the Gloria Gaynor. Uh, the story behind that is like this is the story of her comeback album after 40 years. Yeah. I, do you remember Gloria Gaynor's other hits? Like she, I Will Survive is like the, the that, one everybody knows her for. Yeah, I guess that was like a one hit wonder hit. But yeah. yeah, but no, she had some smaller ones. But I, I Will Survive is the one that I remember the most in my So head. she recently cut a gospel album. Okay. So this is like the story of her comeback. In the gospel uh, with a gospel album, okay, which is really cool. For more info on Tribeca, of course, you can follow our website, and the website for the festival is tribecafilm.com. All right, what do we got up next? Well, next up in this week feature story is Cecil. So uh, we saw this film, um, and it's it makes you laugh because it's it's so much fun. I yeah. gotta say, it's, it's a lot of fun, and uh, it's a new one from Lionsgate. These are the people who brought you the John Wick franchise. And uh, it's it's an action film extravaganza. We'll talk more about it later. But Sisu opened on April 28th. It's about an ex-soldier in the Lapland wilderness uh, of Finland where he has turned gold prospector. He finds new riches in the city. And then but to get to the city, he has to try to get through some Nazis. So I caught up with the director of Sisu, Yalmari Hellander. And joining me now via Zoom, the director of Sisu, Mr. Yalmari Hellander. Welcome, Yalmari. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for being here. I know that you're doing a bunch of these today, and you're coming all the way from Finland. I got a lot of questions, but a little time. I saw the movie last night, really enjoyed it. One one thing I think uh, we should explain is kind of 
what the name means, uh, what Sisu means, and uh, kind of the inspiration behind the film. I would love to know about that. The reason I made the film, because I wanted to explain what Sisu means. So you have to see the film to understand what Sisu means to me. And uh, it's a really finished thing. And uh, and I think uh, I'm, I'm trying to find like a finished things. If, if I'm making a movie from Finland, I, I want to uh, do something really finished like in rare export it was santa claus but in this this uh, particular film it's sisu which basically is like an uh, willpower not to give up the expression it's an interesting expression i was interested also um in your influences i, I saw in the film uh some I, I saw like shades of like a sergio leone uh, a little Sam Peckinpah, some Kubrick. Can you talk about the the kind of the inspiration uh, and and what led you to make the film this way? Probably the biggest influence is behind me the first blood, uh, which like really, really make a made a huge impact on me when I was a kid, and uh, and you can see it from this film very clearly. I think. But the visual style comes from old Western movies, which, which I looked with my dad when I was a kid quite a lot. So I think those are the most, the biggest two influences. Can you talk a little bit about your relationship with the, your lead actor, with uh, Yorma Tomila, and kind of how you work with him and the choice that he would sort of be silent through the whole movie? We have a long relationship with Yorma. He's worked in basically everything I've done. Uh, and um, I knew it from the start that he's going to be Atami. Uh, there, there wasn't any choice in my mind. And, and I needed to have that kind of like a long relationship and, and the respect and, and the trust we have for each other to to be able to do this because he understand exactly what I was going for. And, and I know, I know what he's capable of. And, uh, so we made a good team while we were doing this film and, uh, well, he's awesome in it. Now there's a lot of action in this movie, uh, lots of action. Can you talk a little bit about like your philosophy of action and, and like what makes a good action scene to you? Well, I, I think it's it's good to be able to surprise the audience of what, what you are going to show them next. And, and you always have to top yourself going forward with the film. Uh, that's something what was like, like in the 90s movies, it, it, it was quite often we, you had like a really nice final showdown, like, like the biggest action scene. Is, is the final action scene of the film. I don't know where that has like lost in, in nowadays because it feels like you don't have that anymore. You have the biggest action scene in the middle or something. Uh, I think you have to like make it bigger every step and in the end you need something special. Uh, that's my philosophy of, of doing action. Was there any kind of pressure on you because everything seems to be like a PG-13 movie right now? Like with the superhero films, everything's PG-13. If you want to have a big hit, it should be PG-13. Um, wh what kind of gave you the license to make this a hard R with blood and violence and you know foul language and things like that? That was one thing what was also clear from the beginning that this will be a really violent film i didn't want want to have any rules or anyone to telling me that i can't do this or that uh and uh and because this film doesn't have like a huge budget uh we were able to sell it with petri so that we have the creative control of of everything there was no one telling me like okay maybe you're going too far now or anything like that so i felt like a really nice like a freedom of doing what the fuck i wanted and and it feels good 
Can you talk about a little bit about impact and kind of what, imp, like, I saw this in the theater, and I definitely think it's a big screen movie. I, you know, like, I, I think you're going to get the maximum effect out of this movie watching it on a big screen. How do you want audiences to walk away out of this picture? Well, I, I want them to be, like, surprised and, and uh, smile on their faces that they have seen something that they, like, couldn't imagine they will see going to see this movie or any movie, basically. Because uh, what people are saying to me now is that they are so glad of uh, how entertaining it is and and how it keeps surprising you. No one can guess what Autumn is going to do next. And uh, <clears throat> I, I think it will leave an, a wide smile on everyone's face when they leave out from the theater. Is there anything else that you um, you know want to impart to audiences uh, before uh, before they see the picture? I don't want to spoil anything. I just want to encourage people to to go actually to the movie theater to see this because this film is it doesn't have like that much dialogue. The all the strength and the uh, is in the pictures and in the sound. We we used a lot of time to to try to do that as well as it can be done, to have all that details in the sound and to make it feel alive. And, and I, I, I've seen it in many places and, and the bigger theater you go, the best effect you will have. All right, so um, great interview. He was all the way, we talked to him all the way from Finland. Uh, which so I had to get up early in the morning for that one, which I don't normally have to do for those interviews. But um, what did you think of the film? I enjoyed the film. It was action packed from beginning to end. I I don't know what to say without giving out so much details of the movie, but it was it was I I go see it. You, you have to see this movie. <laughs> That's a solid recommendation from you. So. Uh, I'll talk a little bit. I got some bullet points here. So just to give people some background, the, the film takes place in Finland in 1944. This is basically the end of the war, the end of World War II. The Nazis know they're losing, so they decide to, to do a slash and burn. So we're out in the plains, I guess, of, of Finland in this place called Lapland, which is the middle of nowhere, uh, which makes things really interesting. So I call this movie, I say it's like part spaghetti western, part Rambo, part John Wick, part Mad Max Fury Road some ultra-violent anime thrown in there. And, you know, you kind of make that up into a meat Paul, give it a heart, and you get Sisu. I thought the hero, to me, he kind of looked like Brian Cranston and Clint Eastwood had a middle-aged badass baby <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> and uh, he's so, like, rugged. He looks like he eats shrapnel for breakfast. There's so much action and carnage in this thing. You know, it's a perfect movie if you want to see some Nazis get, you know, exploded. Where its strength lies, it's, it's incredibly simple. It's very straightforward. There are no subplots. It's like a galloping horse running in one direction. You know, it occasionally does stop to breathe, you know, so that, you know, our hero can pull some bullets and shrapnel out of himself. It's a game of this hide and seek, but because of the barren terrain, there's like no okay. place to hide. One of the movies that the director referenced that was a big inspiration to him was Rambo First Blood. But in that movie, he's like in a forest, so he's got places to go and hide, and he and he has the advantage. But in this, it's like you've got tanks and a whole company of Nazis coming after you, and there's nowhere to go, which I thought just gave it not only a great plot element, but also gave it a beautiful look. I noticed that a lot of the scenes looked like they were shot at sunset, so they shot during Golden and Magic Hour. We saw it at the Dolby 88, which has a great sound system. The sound design of this movie is tremendous. You hear all of this great stuff in it and it gives us this real sense of realism and that's juxtaposed by the score which was used quite sparingly i thought it only comes in in key moments but it's this really sort of ethereal haunting almost like this supernatural element of a, a score it was a little eerie <laughs> yeah it has a, it's it like this really eerie, eerie kind of yeah. thing I, and i would say that the other big element of course was the graphic violence uh was this too violent for you no, honestly, I think that because I know uh, you're not a horror movie no, fan. Th this was it was a lot of excitement. It was just I think I was so excited that the horror part of it and the gore it just went away because it was it was much needed. You know, it was much needed. And it's um it's a lot of fun too. It's like to me it looked almost like it reminded me of uh 
sort of an anime violence, like in an animated cartoon, like a Japanese anime, or like um, something out of like a heavy metal comic. Kill Bill. Yeah. yeah. More, more of a Kill Bill. Lots of Tarantino yeah, in yeah, there, yeah, you know. Yeah. But it works. And th there are times where they use the laughter and you, they use the, the, the violence to get laughs. Yes. There's a couple of great laughs in the movie where even though um, it's very serious in a lot of ways, you get these great moments of levity where – because it's, it, it's just ridiculous. Like the violence is so uh, over the top at some points. I think my one sort of criticism of the movie is there are a few mo uh, of these moments where you're like, Why, just shoot him. <laughs> Why don't they just shoot him? Because they don't shoot him. And it, <laughs> You like the you know they have him like they have him dead to rights a couple of times. Yes. And there's a couple of times where he survives, where you're like, okay, the, the, this guy has. To, why is he not dead? But they kind of explain it. He's almost he's almost like a superhero. Yeah. You know he's got like almost like Wolverine powers kind of thing where he just like sort of regenerates. The other criticism is so in this movie we've got you know we've got our hero this grizzled silent strong silent type literally like he never talks. And then we have the Nazis who are pursuing him. And then there is the Nazis have kidnapped these women that they're abusing, So, which gave me the Mad Max Fury Road vibes. Mm -hmm. And there's like one sort of hero woman who talks. And the rest of them I don't think speak at all. I don't think they had any line. And she gets some great stuff. Our hero lady does get some great stuff. Uh, but the rest of those characters really don't get any character development. They do a lot visually, though, where you do kind of see what's happened to them. Like, you can tell by the way they react. You can tell by the way they look. And you can also, you know, see it in their, their attitude. There's a lot of good silent acting. Yes. Actually, the, the most lines are the Nazis. You know, the Nazis, actually, they're bad guys, but they get, and they're very bad guys. Like, you think? Yeah, these are these are not your comic, you know, Nazis. These are, these are not Mel Brooks Nazis. He was heartless. This th these are you know we're gonna burn everything down, kill everybody, uh, kidnap some women and rape them, Nazis. Yes. But they do get some decent development. You know, there's a point in the story where you're like, well, why are they doing this? Like, this guy is you know he's killed a bunch of their guys and what you know why are they. But it's like, well, you know, the war is ending. Mm -hmm. We don't really have a lot of options. Let's get this guy's gold. Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, the main standout is, is our hero played by an actor called Yorma Tamila. And um, he's like, like I said, literally the strong silent type, even though he doesn't really say anything in the film. He's doing so much because not only with with his presence, but the stuff that they say about him, you know, has a lot. And, and he's got this big dilemma. So he's got 500 and something miles to go to a city and everything in between the middle of nowhere where he's prospecting and where he needs to get to is just nothingness. I don't know exactly where they shot it because I don't know Finland geography, but they, they did have some great, uh, from what sets they did have, they did have some great stuff like these burnt down towns and things like that. And some, you know, some really great special effects, great over the top stunts. But one thing, one question is I would say like, who is this movie for? You know, I always ask like, you know, if you recommend a movie, who is it for? Uh, I would say uh, not for the faint of heart. If you can't laugh at ridiculous violence, then this like if you take this too seriously, it's not going to be for you because the action is very strong. It's over the top. And, you know, I even asked him about the the rating and it, like this is a hard R. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no sex in the movie. There's no real nudity or anything except for I think you see that guy naked, but no, he was he was it, he was half. He put on his suspenders. Right. It was just to make you f know what was happening to the girls in the truck. Right. So you but you never see but any of that see, stuff. Right, you don't see the, it. The main part of it is the violence. Yes. Um, so if you can't deal with violence, this is not for you. If you are, I find it almost refreshing now to see a real rated R movie in a theater because everything is like PG thirteen now. Yes. But so if you, you know, if you like action, if you don't mind violence, if you can laugh when it gets utterly ridiculous and suspend your disbelief, highly recommend the movie. That's basically it for today. Looking forward to any more movies um, coming out of the festivals or uh, stuff in theaters? I am waiting for I Am Groot. I, am, I really want to see Guardian of the Galaxy. I'm, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting to see what else can they do from one to two. What can they do with three? And I, I'm just anxious to find out.
how this is going to end. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff coming out, and uh, you know, some of this stuff too. I think movie-wise, is there's still backlog from the pandemic because mm -hmm. they couldn't, they didn't release movies for two years. So like this year, it's like the floodgates are open and everything's coming out. And you know, we're going to have more news on Tribeca and some other film festivals. We're going to be covering Brooklyn. And, but, you know, just keep following the website for all that information. All right, I'm going to wrap up. Thanks once again for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more of our content, including our movie reviews, visit our website, noresfortheweekendpodcast.com. Don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube, youtube.com slash getbehindtherabbit. I'd like to thank my guest, Yalmari Hellander, and our sponsor, JMR Rentals. For B-Trade Oliver and Behind the Rabbit Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.